It's a delight to be here with Rabbi Menachem Creditor, who is the Pearl and Ira Mayer Scholar in Residence at the UJA Federation New York, founder of Rabbis Against Gun Violence, and an author whose most recent book is None Shall Make Them Afraid, a, rabbi, a, a Rabbis Against Gun Violence Anthology. I've been an uh, admirer of yours and your work, and uh, especially on this issue. So thank you for taking some time to chat here. Thanks. Thanks for having me, and I have yours. Thank you. So just to jump right in, why do you think it's a religious imperative, as opposed to just a social or political one, to help to gun violence, and to help to end gun violence? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and, and given your work in the world as well, I think this question comes our way quite a lot. The, the challenge of bifurcating a religious sensibility to being either a social issue or a religious issue or a Jewish issue or an everyone issue, I think that comes from a natural sense of this is too much information, I'm going to handle what I can. And when I have a comfort in a religious sphere, I'd like to just retain my comfort level and not feel uncomfortable. And so if you threaten the sensibility that's so hard for me to achieve for myself where the world makes sense, I'm not sure what to do with myself. What I say with respect to people who typically ask me that question from the outside of the work is when we say that what happens in the social sphere is different than a religious question that we face in a synagogue, let's say, I re remind them that Vayikra Leviticus says pretty clearly that the religious commitment is not to be okay inside my house and forget that there's a street. The recommendation, the requirement, the mitzvah, the obligation from the Torah itself and certainly throughout the, the millennia of interpretation is for the Jewish community to be strong so that it can be of service to cre help create a just society. And so it's a Jewish issue not only because in our, in our tragic history recently uh, as American Jews, the worst attack in American Jewish history happened in Pittsburgh just a little bit over a year ago. Then again, an attack in Poe, both of them massacres with guns. What's important to realize about all that is that, yes, it was the single most violent attack on the Jewish community in American Jewish history, and it was the 12th gun massacre in a house of worship in America in three years at the time. And so we, unfortunately and ironically, we know we belong. We know we've made it because we are vulnerable like everyone else. Amazing. So what is it that you think makes gun violence such a prevalent problem in American society today? Yeah, you know, I, I have a, a talking point on this that I know many faith leaders do, which is that the Second Amendment is very, very close to being a violation of the Second Commandment. Mm. It's really, really important for us to consider what the place of a gun in American culture has been. Mm -hmm. And while I, as a, a proud and very, very committed Jew, believe in sustaining the government and the welfare of society, and therefore the rule of law as articulated in the understanding of the Constitution where we are now, includes the right to bear arms. The fetishized approach to weapons is a very deep problem in America where there are more weapons than people. And the number of people in America, percentage of Americans who own the guns, a small percentage. But gun manufacturers have made a very effective case via their lobbyists to really influence the way our culture and society and governments view restrictions. And the right to self-defense isn't the question. The Torah affirms that. Someone comes to kill me. I have the moral right to protect myself, even to kill the attacker before they can get to me. And so to say that a gun is unacceptable in Jewish terms, that's not the point here. Mm -hmm. The point is that a gun should never become an idol. The second commandment is, you should have no other God but me, the unseeable God in whose name we can't hurt anyone. Great, okay, so just to pick up on this point a little further on, to on Torah, what do you think Torah or Jewish values at large can uniquely contribute or can add can add to this broader American discourse. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to recognize that just as in many traditions, the evolution of who we are, our relationship with God, our relationship with the universe, that changes over time because we are alive, thank God, to really experience new things and to make new neighbors. Um, the world remains fragile and the Jewish community has always been in a, a precarious and vulnerable place. Only recently with the state of Israel do we understand again what it is to have responsibility for a plot of land and a home that we share in our name. Um, I think Judaism has a number of very specific gifts. And they might not be exclusively ours, but I think it's our responsibility to wield them with passion and love. So I think one of them is the recognition that we don't have dogma. 
So in the Jewish community, it's hard not to fall into a reactive place, especially the American Jewish community. We're part and parcel of a very balkanized American moment where people's opinions really do hit each other. And it's hard to imagine we could ever build something together when we disagree on some political questions. But Jewish tradition has affirmed over and over that it's a multivocal way of expressing truth, which means even two rabbis, when we disagree about something, we might actually both be right in God's eyes. And that means whatever I believe to be true is not worth more than your dignity in life. That is a basic truth in Judaism. And I would just offer one example from a very, uh, uh, well, much more recent in general terms, it's only 2,000 years old, an understanding from the Talmud. We have a rule um, that on Shabbat, traditionally we don't carry items from place to place, from private domain to public domain, or even from private to another private domain. The exception is when you're wearing something. So I can carry my clothes because I'm not carrying them, I'm wearing them. The rabbis in the Talmud, I think actually this might have been an essay of yours that I've also read. Um, the rabbis of the Talmud have a question. Well, if that's the case, I have a sword. It's an adorned sword. It's beautiful. Am I allowed to carry it on Shabbat? Can I wear it from place to place? And so it becomes a philosophical question of, can a weapon be considered an ornament, an adornment. And the answer from the rabbis tells us something that we could uniquely contribute to, to the American gun violence epidemic to end it, which is, no, guns are ugly. No matter what you do to the handle of a pistol, no matter how revered this weapon might be as its place in history might have it, we might need weapons sometimes in order to protect ourselves, but they are not beautiful. Judaism does not see the unfortunately sometimes necessary weapon as a thing of beauty. You can't wear it, it's not pretty. So maybe it's not the same, but when the American culture that we are living in came to understand the ravaging effects of cigarettes and they stopped being sexy and started being seen as malignant curses on our bodies, there's something to be said about the way that we talk about guns, the way that we see guns, yeah. and to see them as not pretty at all. Yeah, you know, and this is not just a gender conversation, but on this topic of beauty, it does feel like a part of this is about reimagining masculinity. Yes. What does it mean to be handsome? What does it mean to be attractive? What does it mean to be masculine? Right. And that notion of being aggressive or being tough or being strong or being forceful which is what makes a weapon beautiful for, for a man in some ways. It, may, it actualizes my masculinity uh, itself is something to be challenged. Yes, I think that's right. I think that's right. We're, we're in a, a very strange moment that has yet to be defined and maybe never will be, but with the advent of, of you know, it's not a new movement, but calling it the Me Too movement is helpful to recognize that actually male vulnerability is probably a healthier way to begin even looking at myself, let alone expressing myself in public. And if a gun is um, an attempt by men, not only obviously, to feel more secure in the world, that actually requires a lot of introspection because why should I need anything outside of myself, especially something that could hurt someone else in order for me to feel okay in the world. Mm -hmm. I understand where all of that complex thinking comes from. I think it's a natural feeling for any human being um, to feel vulnerable in the world. Who doesn't? The question is, what do I do to answer that? Am I making someone else more vulnerable by trying to erase my own? Yeah, love it, love it. Okay, so someone says, look, Rabbi Creditor, I'm totally on board, I'm fired up, I totally agree with you, what can we do? So what do you think American Jews should be doing right now yeah. to help to, uh, to address this problem and make America safer? Yeah, I appreciate that question more than anything else because for all the philosophical stuff and historical stuff, this is a moment that requires action and response. Uh, let me start with what I think we should not do. What I think we should not do is align gun violence as an American epidemic with exclusively anti-Semitic hatred. Mm -hmm. The thing that we cannot do is to ghettoize ourselves out of fear. So number one, let's never ever allow ourselves to imagine, even if our trauma is well-earned, we should not imagine that this is actually only about us. It's not. Guns are not a Jewish issue only but it should be a Jewish issue because it's an everyone issue. The different kinds of gun violence that are ravaging our country to the, to the number which is unfathomable of around 40,000 human souls in America losing their lives to gun violence every year. 
I began my work shocked by a mass shooting and realized how little I knew as soon as I got involved because urban gun violence does much more damage and suicide by gun does much more damage than I ever understood. So I think number one, it's not only about us. Number two is to recognize that the vulnerability that the American Jewish community absolutely in an elevated way has felt since Pittsburgh has been felt by different sectors of the American community for a very long time. And so the ravages of gun violence have been happening for a long time and now it's our turn to step into this conversation for those who haven't yet and learn, not come at it as if we are the experts or the wonks, we can turn to organizing groups like Every Town and like Moms Demand and the Brady Campaign and the Coalition to End Gun Violence. But I would say this, don't do it alone. Ask your faith leader if they've become involved already in the effort. And if not, ask how you can help connect your community to a larger societal effort and stand with our sisters and brothers outside of, outside of the Jewish community because they've been standing there for a long time. Amazing. Amazing. Love it. Okay. So my last question for you um, is the personal one. Like how did you get involved in this movement to work to help to eradicate gun violence? Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, uh, it's one of those moments where we say, right? Today is the day I acknowledge my mistakes. Mm -hmm. I, I was sitting in a meeting on the day that the, the Sandy Hook uh, massacre happened. And I got a call because I was on a, it was an emergency liturgy team. Um, and someone called and said, you heard what happened, and I, I hadn't. And so they brought my attention to it, um, all, the, all the children that were killed and the teachers killed. And my eyes were just, I don't know, I couldn't see anymore. And I think that was the reaction a lot of us had. If we had a long-term memory, we would think about Columbine before that. And if we had a long-term memory, we would think about all the days between. Um, and I started to pay attention, but only to a point the pastor across the street uh, from my synagogue in Berkeley, California, was uh, bringing an interfaith coalition to the White House. And he said, would you like to come? I said, of course, I have to be there. And so I, I looked at the list and I realized I was the only Jew. And I said to him, Pastor Michael McBride, dear, dear friend, and a really important figure in today's American moment. Um, and I said, would you like, would you like me to help recruit a few more religious leaders from the Jewish community? And so we had a group of 90 total people. Nine of us were rabbis. And as soon as we got there, I realized something really striking. The nine of us were the only white people in the room. Mm. And I'd never thought of myself in that way. This was a moment where I just realized how little I knew about almost everything. And we sat at the tables at the White House mixed around. And the facilitator had us all answer this question. The facilitator said, share the gun violence death that hurt you the most, that affected you the most. And all the rabbis, with one exception, my father, who's a rabbi in Richmond, Virginia, who had a dear friend who was killed by a gun. All the rabbis basically said, I don't know. I don't know anyone. But the majority of the African-American pastors at the table looked up and they said, you want me to name one? And all of a sudden I realized what I didn't know. And so my involvement really did begin then with a recognition that I was reacting to mass shootings, which are 3% of the gun violence deaths in America. Uh, and because of that, I became more and more involved. And then with, with colleagues founded the group Rabbis Against Gun Violence. And we published a number of collections and we began acting in concert and coalition with allies like Moms Demand Action. Um, and now I think that the Jewish community, even before Pittsburgh, but certainly since, is alive to our responsibility and how much this is our issue too. Amazing. Well, I wish you continued success in your efforts. Uh, we need it so bad. And uh, I hope listeners will, will follow. What, is there a, uh, there's the publication which we mentioned. Is there a, yes. a Facebook page or just a closed group? There is. No, you can find us. There's a public page with, a, with about a thousand people who are pretty active on it. It's called Rabbis Against Gun Violence. You can find us there. Amazing. Thanks so much. You got it. Thanks, Shmuley.